later in your time. Hopefully more people will turn in. My name is Tati Yarral, and I work for the Fundación Mexico in Harvard. And you'll be hearing more about what we do later throughout the presentation. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Charles Allison. He's a senior member of the HBS Admissions Board and a former HBS, well, an HBS alumna. And also thank you to our great panelists that are here tonight. They're all alumni of the business school. And they'll be um, sharing with you their experiences throughout the program and post-program. So thank you all for welcoming. Thank you very much for taking the time uh, to come here with us. My name is Charles Allison. I'm a member of the admissions board of the business school, uh, as well as an alum of the school. Uh, what I'm going to do is go through a bit of a PowerPoint presentation, and thank you, we actually kind of blew up because the screen is a little bit small, and we want to make sure you're able to see it. Go through a little bit of an overview of the academic program at HBS, as well as talk about the admissions process, uh, and, and of course answer questions. What we've done is we've invited um, some local alums to come and talk also about their experiences, uh, to be able to answer questions and so forth. So just so you have something to think about in terms of who they are and what they've done. Maybe you could just briefly introduce yourselves, say what year, where you went undergrad, uh, and uh, what you did uh, before uh, HBS, and uh, kind of what you're doing now. Thanks. So uh, I graduated from HBS uh, back in 2007, and I went to college at the DAM. I studied economics. Uh, you forgot to say your uh, name. Jose Antonio Moran. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Uh, previous to HBS, I worked both in the nonprofit sector and in the private sector. At the beginning of my career, I worked in uh, environmental uh, economics. Then I switched completely to uh, venture capital. And um, after HBS, I kept working in venture capital, and um, um, that's it. I have been working now for 10 years, almost, in, in BC. Hi, so uh, my name is Jorge Fernandez Gallardo. I, I did undergrad at Ibero right here uh, next to next to CIDE. I studied uh, engineering, mechatronics and production, like something like super geeky. And um, afterwards, I, I worked for a bit in operations and sales, uh, mainly in the logistics business for the HL Express, a uh, big company. And from there, I went to, uh, to HBS in 2012, just graduated in 2014. And I've been working, uh, after HBS, I, I did a little bit of working around the world because I thought it was interesting. And then I decided to come back to Mexico and I've been working at a startup that I founded for the past year and a half or something like that. Uh, I'm working on e-commerce right now, basically building and running uh, online stores for different brands. So it's uh, very exciting, super difficult, and complicated, and frustrating, <laughs> but uh, very interesting. Uh, and um, yeah, that's basically me. Hello everyone, my name is Kareem Meliani, uh, I'm from New Jersey, USA, but I've been living in Mexico City for about a year and a half. I uh, graduated from HBS in, in 2012. Uh, prior to business school, I worked in the financial sector, um, two years in banking focused on real estate, and then one year in uh, private equity investing, focused in the hotel sector. Uh, went to HBS and changed gears completely. Right now I work for a multinational called Sealed Air. It's uh, in the packaging industry. So we make all different types of protective packaging, such as uh, bubble wrap, foam, mailers, and other products that protect the products that uh, arrive at your home when you order something online, for example. So very excited to be here, uh, share my experiences with you all. Thanks. Okay, excellent. So what we're going to do is show you just a brief little video. I'm just curious, how many people have been to Boston? Okay. How many have been to Harvard University? Okay. How many have been on the Harvard Business School campus? Oh, okay. So that's actually pretty good. So some of this will look very familiar to you. So, uh, and for those of you that haven't seen it, I think it's just good to have a little context. what it's like on the first day, moving in. Getting to know your classmates. Those early classes.
This is a student center where often students will meet for their study groups uh, before class starts. Now they support it shares. 50% of the class shows up with family, with children. There's a lot of work, uh, collaboration, uh, working teams. We're very mobile. There's something called field. Field is um, it has a local experience where students actually work uh, in emerging markets around innovation problems, uh, some with startups, some with um, multinational corporations. There's even a show, it's really put together from the Broadway show. Uh, I just want a full disclosure, there is snow in Boston. <laughs> but often the weather is beautiful. business plan competitions. Two years goes like that. I don't know if you guys remember graduation, right? I mean, and two years does go like that, right? Just like uh, that. It's a blink. Um, and you may have noticed in uh, one of the videos around uh, graduation, there was someone carrying a baby across the stage at graduation. So uh, uh, Anna from the foundation, uh, uh, she and her husband were there uh, 15 years ago. Uh, she had a baby three weeks before graduation. And so Arturo was carrying uh, your son yeah. across the stage, right? So it's very sweet. That's very sweet. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about academics. Uh, at Harvard Business School, it's a two-year program. Uh, the required curriculum is the first year, and the elective curriculum is the second year. So I'm going to ask the alums to talk a little bit about uh, their experience. So, um, case method is the one thing that differentiates Harvard Business School from any other program. Um, about 85% of the cases that are used at all the other business schools around the world come from HBS. Uh, we print, research, and sell and market these cases globally. Uh, there are over 200 faculty members and a full team of researchers around the world in eight research centers that are writing cases up to date. I'm sure there's a case already on Brexit. I'm sure there's a case already on uh, the election of 2016. I'm not going to say anything more about that. <laughs> I'm holding my breath. Um, but it's the best way we think to learn. Real cases are about real companies with real problems with real people. And in every case, 25, 30, 40 pages, you read this two, three hours of preparation the night before, um, and your headset is, what would you do? The question that gets asked in every case is, what would you do? You could be the CEO of a large business. You could be the prime minister of the country. You could be a first year associate in a particular firm. You could be a member of a labor union. You could be a regulator. You could be a banker. You could be a marketer. Uh, and across all the disciplines and all the classes, you get used to, over the course of five or 600 cases, answering this question, what would you do? Uh, at the beginning of each class, a faculty member will start by saying uh, to you, would you like to get us started? You have six or seven minutes to kind of uh, lay out what your recommendation is. Option B, here's the data that supports my option. Here's some questions that I have about it. Here's some other information I wish was in the case that wasn't. Here's some information in the case I didn't understand. And during that time, the professor is sort of writing the comments on a series of blackboards. Um, you're not quite sure why some things were on this left board and some things were on this right board, but you're just talking the way you kind of open it. It's an open. And after five or six or seven minutes, the professor says, so uh, thanks, Charles. That was great. Um, we appreciate that. Um, who disagrees with Charles, by the way? And 80 hands go up. Um, it's humble. Do you remember the first time you opened? And the professor then said, hey, uh, who disagrees? And hands went up, right? That's right? And you're thinking, I'm a smart person. I spent three hours last night doing this analysis. And out of 90 people, you know, 80 people think that my answer is not the right answer. How, how would you react to that? Yeah, it's a little humbling. Um, but what you come to realize is it's not about the right answer. It's about the pros and cons of all the options. And you learn that um, if you put a lot of smart people in the room, you give the data to look at, people are going to come to different conclusions. 
So that's a pretty interesting and fascinating thing. You think that's really important. Um, career and professional development is another differentiating factor we think at HBS. Did all of you use a career coach? Yeah, so uh, whoever wants one at CPD, Career and Professional Development, has an opportunity to use a personal career coach that knows something about the industry that you're interested in. So the idea is, uh, as you can tell, there were some career switchers here, um, and some, maybe they came knowing what they wanted to do, uh, maybe they had a view about what they wanted to do, and they might have changed their mind, um, but that coach is there to sort of help you think through some of those issues. They're not a, a job placement agency, uh, but they are uh, someone that knows something about consumer product marketing, about venture capital, about healthcare, about um, uh, government, and they give you uh, their best advice and opinions along those um, along those different fields. So it's really a great, unique opportunity to have. Um, for those of you that went to Boston, this should kind of look familiar, maybe at least from the ground level. So this is Harvard University. Um, which is quite large. There's 16 separate schools, Harvard College, Harvard Business School, Harvard Curie School, Public Health, uh, Harvard Law School, uh, Graduate School of Design. Um, and this, just across the river, the first stop there in, in Cambridge is Harvard Kennedy School. And just across this bridge, this is Harvard Business School. There are about 40 buildings, it's on 22 hectares. Uh, it's fairly self-contained. What you have is living space, learning space, uh, where you can eat, there are dormitories, there are condominiums, there's uh, gym facilities, there are athletic fields. Uh, you pretty much have access to anything you might want on campus. Uh, there's even a tunnel system if you live in the dorms. So when you when it's winter and there's that snow is out there, you can wear sweatpants and uh, flip-flops and boxes, uh, channel Puerto Vallarta, and show up in class, no problem. Right, so that's kind of an interesting way people sometimes fight the winter, never having to go outside. You know, that's a pretty good deal. Okay, so uh, who's going to talk about the first year? I think I am. Okay. So, anything or anything like, you want to say? Why, okay. why is it the required curriculum? Uh, how many classes do you take? And, um, why do you think, did, did you get any benefit of uh, not having any choice to take everything? at the same time, with the same people, with the same, yeah, talk about the section experience. Okay, okay, okay. So the ERC year, yeah, so basically it's two semesters. Um, it's 10 classes, five semesters each. And the idea is you basically get to, get like, at first like an introduction of like all the different areas that you might find their company or like any organization that you might like uh, work or encounter in the world. So basically, uh, first semester is accounting, finance, uh, you get a leadership class, you get um, accounting, operations, no, accounting, operations, operations and, marketing. And, marketing. and marketing. Yeah. And then for the second semester, you get a class on entrepreneurship, you get a class on BD, which is like the international environment and macroeconomics and like super interesting class about the world. Uh, finance too, then you have uh, like a leadership slash uh, like strategy. ethics corporate class, accountability. yeah, corporate accountability and strategy. So basically, you're covering like the whole like set of different areas that you might like find in a company, and you end up like after the first year and after like so many cases in so many industries and like such different companies and situations, and you analyze countries and. and it's you end up like getting like a lot of information in the world, and for me at least, and I don't know if it was the case with uh, with my two other co-panelists, so, but basically what you end up is you en you enter HPS as a very like smart and driven and accomplished individual who by the start of like by the end of the, like the first week you end up feeling like the most like inappropriate person to be there. Like, it's a very, very humbling experience because you're used to be, like, the smart one in the room, like, the, the one that everyone looks up to and, like, asks for advice and when you say something, like, people will nod and be like, yes, that's the, the one thing to do. And as Charles was saying, like, the first year is all about, like, finding out that you know nothing about the world. Like, you might be, like, very good at, like, a certain specific thing that you used to do, for example, like, finance or something, and you, you know some stuff. But you know, like, the world is like the whole table and you're like, good at, like, a small piece of, like, it, you know, like, you know nothing about the world. And that's a very interesting part of, like, the, the first year, it 
helps you understand like everything that exists. Like you discover industries that you didn't even know were there. Like for example, I didn't even know like what private equity was. Like I didn't even know that existed. I I'd never uh, like actually had to work on a balance sheet. And I didn't know what like net present value was because, but things that I had studied and I'd done, it was just not necessary. And I was very good at what I did before that, but you, you find out uh, that, that this is um, kind of like the world, you discover things. And throughout this experience, what's like very interesting is you're very, very covered and um, you're always surrounded by amazing people who also feel the same way that you do. And it's, uh, at first at least, and that's the section experience, it's you're, you're surrounded by 90 to 93 people in the same room who take all the classes with you for the same year, for, for the whole year, and pretty much become your family. And as in any family, you don't like everyone the same, and you don't become like best friends with everyone. But it's still your family, and it's still people who uh, who try to help you, who will be there for you, and who will support you during this uh, difficult and amazing times at, at the same time. Jorge, so, was there anyone uh, that when you, these topics that you didn't know around finance and so forth, did you get any help from any section? Always, always. Uh, I mean, you pretty much like by the first case you, you find out, or by the first week, you find out who knows something about this subject that you know nothing about. And you can just reach out for help. And, and it's amazing because people will be willing to help. And um, one thing that's uh, very cool I think about HBS is these are all very, very competitive people. But at the same time, and for some weird reason that I cannot like, still like, explain myself, these are people who are willing to help everyone around them. So it's, it's kind of like a weird experiment where everyone's trying to like upper their bar, like you know, like you're playing at this level, but by helping others, you force yourself to play like at a higher level, and you try like to bring everyone else like up with you, which is pretty cool. Uh, so it's like people want to help, they still want to compete with you, but they don't want to make it an unfair fight. So uh, and a fight, entre comillas, no, not really a fight. Um, so, great, great experience, uh, and yeah, as, as, as Charles was saying, everything's set up for you, your classes are set up for you, your schedule's set up for you, you just show up and pretty much do everything that's there according to plan. You have this class on, t on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on, Friday, on Thursday and Friday, everything's on your calendar, and you pretty much just show up for all the academic stuff, it's set up. You even have your specific seat that you are assigned to like for the whole semester. You have one for the first semester, another one for the second semester, uh, and and then that's your like small piece in the in the room. That's you, you know? and you know where everyone in your family is sitting because they're always there. So you just know where to like look out for for help or for a smile or for a you know for a disapprovement uh, uh, sign. Uh, very very cool. Uh, so the, there are uh, 10 sections of 90 each, roughly. The class size is about 900. Uh, so as Jorge said, you stay with the same uh, 89 other people uh, for the entire first year. So you get to know people very well. Uh, everyone has good days, uh, everyone has bad days, and sometimes you have ugly days. Um, with class participation counting 50% of your grade, um, there's nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. You have to find your voice and have a voice. Um, not everyone is a person of many words. I'm sure you'll remember there were some people in your section that were people of few words, uh, and in some there were people of many words. But whether there are few words or many words, uh, they were really interesting, smart, uh, thoughtful, uh, and meaningful things that come out of people's mouths. People are very serious about being there and making sure that you show up for class and you're prepared. The faculty is prepared. Uh, there's an expectation that the students were, are prepared. And you don't want to let any of your section mates down uh, by um, you know, not being engaged. So it's a wonderful collaborative experience. Um, you know, when you say it's kind of a fight, it's like when you're wrestling with your little brother, right? I mean, you're not trying to kill your little brother. Maybe you are. Um, but that's not really what the point is. The point is um, you're there to really have some fun in the community. So. Um, and to make each other like a better like person and just like student and everyone. Like everyone's trying to make everyone else better. Yeah. And so we end up in any given section, there might be people from 60 different countries. 
uh, any different class. We admit from 85 different countries around the world. 42% uh, of the class are women. So out of 900 students, 42% are women. Um, that's larger than some whole business school programs. Okay, so that's remarkable. 35% uh, are international. Uh, there are people from 385 different universities around the world. Um, so we know very much where people are coming from and what their level of academic study, rigor is, and so forth. So it's, uh, it's quite interesting in that, in that regard. Um, the first year also, uh, there's something called field. Field Immersion Experience and Leadership Development. Uh, do you want to talk about your field experience? Sure. So for field, uh, and Charles was telling me that it has changed over the past year, but when I, when I did it, it, it's basically comprised of uh, three different modules. It's now comprised of two, uh, from what I hear. But basically, the, the first one is um, you try to get, and this is in Boston for the first semester, you get uh, like a bunch of tools that you might use for communication, for being a better leader, for um, acting different characters, for being able to like relate to different kinds of personalities and, and, and whatnot. Uh, so that's like, a very theoretical, not that much uh, like a practical class. It's still fun, and it's uh, at the beginning, so it also helps to uh, for you to get better accustomed and better re like relationships with your with your section. Then uh, for the second part, which is a very fun part, you get to travel and you get to pick an emerging market, which was uh, what was on the on the video, and. Basically, you get to go to, I went to Malaysia, for example, for, for 10 days. Uh, but people go to India, China, uh, they're coming to Mexico next year, next year. When I was there, Mexico was not an option. Uh, people have gone to Costa Rica, Brazil, Argentina, uh, a bunch of, uh, bunch of South Africa, Had you been to India. Malaysia before? I haven't been to Malaysia. But, and that's one of the things that, that uh, the class requires. You have to pick a country that you've never been to before and that you're not familiar with and that you know nothing about. And an interesting part of this, and this, when I was there, it used to be in the January term, so from like January 10 to like the 20th or something like that. Uh, it's now moved to April, spring semester. Uh, spring semester. Yeah. So around spring break or something? Um, it's actually during, um, you know, during, uh, I think it probably is a little bit timed around spring break, either the beginning of the semester or the end of the semester sort of thing. But like March, April, no? No, no, I, 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 I still tell you, I'd have to look and see what the dates are because they're a little floating around. Because okay. it's coordinating 900 people going around the world in 16 cities and 14 countries uh, for 10 days and working on these project teams is a bit of a uh, logistical It's a logistical uh, challenge. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, did everyone make it back from your field program? Okay. Everyone did. Everyone all, all did. All ten fingers and all ten toes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And um, what'd you work on? Who'd you work so, on? You work on? I worked for this guy who was an entrepreneur in Malaysia and who had a car company that would used to drive people to to and, and from the airport into Malaysia City. And that was his uh, usual business. But now what he was launching, and it was like completely crazy, he was trying to launch a, a theater, like an attraction in the airport. So his theory was people are traveling and they have some spare time while they're in between flights or while they're waiting for the flight or they just got there and for some reason they got energy. So, uh, so I'm just going to put a theater in the airport and people are going to come and buy tickets and go watch it. So it was very interesting because it's, it's crazy ideas that you work on and the, the way that the teams are, are comprised, it's, it's not like you choose people who know something about this. Uh, is you have, it's teams of six? Six, right? Yeah. Okay. And uh, you just put them together. A very interesting part of this, it's, it's still the first year, but these are teams that are comprised of six different people from six different sections. So this is also like where the whole like mingling begins with a bunch of people that you didn't even know existed and are taking the same MBA as you are. Uh, and they turn out to be also great. You just didn't have class with them. And um, so that's very interesting. And these people, like, it's a team that is, is formed in a, in a collaborative way and with trying to have people with different backgrounds and different experiences so that it, it, in the end you have a team that's very functional and knows about a bunch of stuff and can help the actual company that they're working at. The, um, the idea, and at least this was when I was there, but the challenge that they pose to people who want to present projects uh, when they apply to HBS so that people, so that students come and help them out in these countries is 
uh, the students have to, have to help you out, launch a new business or a new product or a new service, but something completely new within the business. So in my case, it was this entrepreneur with the theater thing, but there was um, different different things. I, I mean, there were projects in the financial industry. There were there was a project. There was a team working in Malaysia when I was there, like just a different team in a different company with a bank, for example, launching a completely new program. I think it was a debit card with some uh, perks for low-income uh, class population. So it's a whole different problem, whole different uh, skill set that you need. A whole different team, but I mean, I might as well just have been assigned there. I mean, it was a possibility. In the end, you end up working in a project that's very interesting and very complex and and super um, tough to handle, but but in a great way, uh, with people that you've never worked with. And uh, you start working on the project from uh, like two or three months before you actually travel to the country. You get to know the project, you get a brief, you get a bunch of Skype calls with uh, the people that you're gonna be working at. Uh, sometimes these calls are like odd hours because if you're talking to someone in India, for example, and you're in Boston, uh, the, the, the time to communicate with, with, uh, with the company or the entrepreneur or whoever you're gonna be working with might be 11 p.m. or might be 5 a.m. And then you just have to adapt and you have to uh, learn that this is a global and interconnected world, which is something that some people that come into the, the program have experienced, but not everyone. I would say the majority have experienced a local work, uh, a local work experience, uh, work at a certain country. Uh, a lot of the Americans have never actually left the US, but a bunch of the other internationals have neither. So I'd never worked out of Mexico, for example, before HBS. And this opens your eyes to a whole set of possibilities and just learning that you can actually go there and, and, and work and be very, um, have a very positive impact in a project in a country that you knew nothing about and that you still need to adapt to, uh, to the local rules and, and regulations and you have to think about things that you've never thought about, like a different tax system when you've always assumed there's only one. Um, so. Great. Yeah, it's an exciting experience. The idea is to take you as far outside your, your comfort zone as possible. You go to a country where you've not worked with a language you don't necessarily speak, um, uh, in a sector you don't have experience. You're working with five people that you know are classmates of yours, but they're not in your section, they're in different sections. You have about 10 days to get this work done. It's around a problem of innovation for either a startup like business, an entrepreneurial business. Some people work on field science for multi billion dollar companies. And then at the end of those 10 days, you have to give a presentation to the CEO of that business. Exactly. No pressure. Uh, no pressure. You think the bar is high? I mean, this is, this is real work, real people, real problems. And when you go in that room with the entrepreneur, and maybe some of his investors were there, uh, they were listening very carefully, and I'm sure they asked a few questions. They did. And the quality of the output of the work that you actually present is, is pretty high. And because, as Charles was saying, like, this is a very fun experience and everyone's having a lot of fun, but they also take it very, very seriously. Everyone takes it very seriously. And there's something that you have there, which is like this kind of like reputation bar that you have to uphold. So both a personal reputation that you can actually do great work and present it to people in the real world, but also like the school reputation. And this is something that everyone takes super seriously. So that's also something that everyone works very collaboratively, collaboratively. Um, around, like presenting something that's super high quality, great recommendation, and it's uh, what you come up with with such a short period of time is, is quite amazing. Yeah. And uh, I think what, uh, one uh, way to sort of see, well, how does this work? How has it uh, been? Uh, this will be the fifth year. Uh, so there are about 185 different projects, you know, divided by six, six people each, 185. I think a good testament is uh, all those companies, they sign up for a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth. Um, so it's really a testament to uh, the level of work and output that they get. And I think it's probably thought of as a pretty important experience in the first year of uh, the RC. So. Uh, second year. So the first year is the RC, the required curriculum. The second year is called the EC, the elective curriculum. Let's not talk about EC. Correct. I will. OK. Thanks. All right. <clears throat> um, so for, for EC year, it's, uh, I, I think the, the, the feeling is very different from, from RC. You kind of ha have the hang of it already, feel good about, uh, you know, ability to, to prepare for, for cases, ability to handle the academics, and, and really the, the concept of the, the year 
for me and um, maybe my, my, my colleagues here might, might have a different opinion, but it's just, all right, I kind of got the hang of HBS, but you know, what, what's, what's going to be next? You know, how, first, how do I enjoy the second year? I think um, most folks would agree the, the first year is, is much more difficult, more strenuous. It's an adjustment learning how to do cases and things like that. But for the, the second year, for me, I, I break it down into a few different groups. So re recruiting, uh, social events and social life, academics, um, and I want to touch on uh, the point on, on career coaching as well that, that Charles brought up. Um, so first for, for academics, the, one of the, the major differences is that you know, you're, no, you're no longer taking classes with your, or just with your section. It's all, it's all mixed in. You, know, you have to, to bid for, for classes, there's a system, you know, there are reviews of classes, and folks generally go where, where their interests are, as well as taking some other classes that are just known to be you know, very popular or have an excellent professor or something like that. Uh, additionally, there are also half semester courses, so you can really get a very broad experience across different subject matter by taking, you know, split a semester to take, you know, t uh, half a semester of strategy and another half of marketing or another uh, half semester of a, a real estate course, a course that might be shared in between uh, two different graduate schools, something like that. For, for me, after um, getting the broad overview, uh, that Jorge m mentioned in, in the first year, for the second year, I wanted to focus more on, on marketing and, and on strategy, really, really on, on sales. I mean, there, at the time, there was no specific sales class, but th these were the, the, the classes that I could get closest to the, the sales concept with. So, uh, I mean, I think another point to, to mention here uh, is the, this expectation of preparation. I think it, it's, it's, it, it continues into the second year. And everybody has had that, that first year to really get the hang of how to prepare for, for a course. But in the, second, in the second year, I mean, you have a lot of folks who are very interested in, in that topic. So I think one of the great things about, about HBS is just that quality of the discussion. You, you can find yourself sitting in a class listening to some of your classmates and just saying, wow, this person is brilliant. Or they, they just brought up an insight that I never would have thought of. So for me, that, that's, that's a, a big value. Another one that, I mean, I, I still think about frequently today, and I mean, this is something that you see in, in the first and the second year, is just to be able to take um, incomplete information that, that you will get in the case and have to come to a decision. Because, I mean, I'm, I'm certain in, in the startup world, but even you know, in, in, the, in the, the large corporate sector, every day we have to, to take decisions and think about uh, strategic direction without having all the information that, that we would love to have to, to check every single box, but we have to prepare and come to a meeting prepared to, to argue a position. And really, this is what you do in HBS for, for two years, day in and day out. So in terms of real life preparation and, and something that's useful for, for your career afterwards, really in, in whatever sector you decide to go in, the, that practice is, is, uh, is excellent. Um, other points on, on academics, a lot more flexibility, ability to do uh, field studies directly for a company. Um, you can have a professor that, well, at least in my time, uh, do they still do that? Field studies, like for a semester? Sure, independent or with groups. Okay, yeah, so you can do in, uh, in, in some cases, every semester companies will post field studies. So, you know, they have, they have a project, they want you know, an MBA or a team of MBAs to come work on that project. So the university get, gives you flexibility to pursue your professional interests and your academic interests in, in that form. So I, I mean, I participated in, in a study for the company I'm at now and spent a semester researching the market for a new product that was in, uh, in development, it had a sustainability angle that was a bit different from anything we had produced before. So, and I had a professor to, to bounce ideas off of, to try to help me think about you know, diff different ways to, to penetrate a new market. Do you think that helps you get a job? Um, well, I, I was already going back to the company after the, the internship. Ah, okay. So, you worked for them for the summer? Yeah, I worked for, the, for, for it's called Sealed Air Corporation. The office is actually right around the corner here in, in uh, Santa Fe. But I worked for them for the summer and, you know, Knowing that I wanted to, to go back full time, it was an opportunity to, to really, in, in a way, get a head start, uh, and also really try to, um, you know, learn a lot about the market that I was about to be participating in. Okay, great. Um, so beyond that, from oh, 
one other point on, on academics, and it, this is also for first and second year, one of my favorite things about HBS was the, the quality of speakers that, that would come to, to visit class. So in, in many cases, we talk about the, um, the entrepreneur or the CEO or the you know, manager that the, the case is written about, but in many times that actual person came to class and sat in, listened to the discussion, and afterwards they told us what happened. So it, it was just awesome to have that, that person there to, to ask them questions about, you know, what did you think when you were in this situation? Uh, one of the, the more popular classes when I, when I was in uh, my EC year, and it's a bit, uh, I guess, one, one distinctive point there as far as entrepreneurship. Obviously, the, the tech sector is very popular. Many, many folks are going to Silicon Valley, going to, to Mexico as well. Uh, uh, I would say the tech sector is growing a lot here, different places in, in, in Europe as well. But search funds in particular, more they, they were not tech companies, whereas you know, some folks will go to the, towards the, the VC world for investments, searchers will go to more traditional companies, you know, buy out a family business where the, the owner wanted to retire or something like that. I mean, doesn't this sound like fun? I mean, does this really sound like school? I mean, school is you, it, traditionally for a lot of us, undergrad, for example, was you go to a classroom, the professor is there, the relationship you mostly have is the back of their head, uh, they're writing on the board. I mean, does this sound familiar? Right? And every once in a while they turn around and say, oh yeah, is everybody with me? Right? And, but this is a whole different experience, um, that uh, some of which is highly orchestrated, and some of which gives you the opportunity to sort of take as much uh, leeway, as much time, uh, and thoughtfulness to pursue your dream and what you want to do. Um, live where you learn, 85% of the students live on campus, uh, the facilities are there. Uh, one thing that I think everyone will agree is you never have enough time. Uh, there was this thing that people called FOMO, you know what FOMO is? F-O-M-O, -O, uh, fear of missing out. Uh, because there's speakers on campus, you've got to recruit, you've got to read your cases, uh, you have to have a social life, uh, you have to travel, you have to uh, make decisions about, do I want to go hear Sheryl Sandberg speak, the CEO of Facebook, Facebook um, or uh, Jeff Emmel, the CEO of General Electric, uh, the Saudi oil minister is at the Kennedy School, now he might have something to say that might be worth listening to, um, and, and all of these are happening on a particular day at 2 o'clock. So how do you decide? So there are lots of things to do. So living on campus in the community really gives you an opportunity to get to know people better, not just the people in your section, the people that are in clubs that you belong to, where you live in a dorm or in a Soldier's Field or One Western Avenue, um, and you really get more about um, the benefits. You can really optimize those benefits. Uh, HBS has, uh, of course, coursework in lots of different sectors and lots of different areas. Uh, but there are four special initiatives that we think are just a little bit extra that we focus on. Social entrepreneurship, business and energy, sort of the environment, um, healthcare, uh, and social... Uh, healthcare... Enterprise. Social enterprise. Oh, social and social enterprise. So it's, these are just areas that we think that faculty, uh, students, uh, alumni really focus a lot of energy on helping um, think about and solve some of these big thorny issues around healthcare and social enterprise and entrepreneurship. I mean, entrepreneurship isn't something that's new at HBS. It's been a department for 35 years. Uh, the Rock Center is all about innovation. Uh, we're creating a, a healthcare innovation center that's new um, to the iLab, uh, the, the innovation lab. So we're constantly thinking and rethinking and trying to adjust and make changes uh, that are responsive to the market. Uh, that are responsive to the world as it changes. Uh, and obviously we're talking about responsive to clients. Who are, who are our clients? Well, the students. Right? That's where we think about it. Um, there are 80,000 alumni, uh, basically uh, around the world, 55,000 um, MBA graduates, and about, uh, the rest are in the executive education programs. Uh, everyone's heard of six degrees of separation? Everyone knows someone, 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 someone in the world. Uh, we think about this as one degree of separation. Um, I put in a, a subject line of an email a favor from a fellow HBS alum. I get a 95% return. I'm able to introduce people uh, to people I don't know that I have never met around the world. Um, and you, it's hard to go someplace and not have HBS alums. I think it's at 345 in Mexico City. Um, 
but you can travel the world, you can basically uh, pick up the database and see who is in Istanbul, or who is in London, or who is in Paris, or who is in Mexico City. And um, for the most part, you contact people, they're prepared to talk to you, whether they're 10 or 15 years your senior, uh, CEOs of businesses, multi-billion dollar businesses, people take the time. Um, I think that part of that is whether or not you have been out for five years, 10 years, 15 years. I had a panel last year in Monterey. Uh, there was someone that just graduated in, in uh, 2015, and someone that was just coming back from his 50th reunion. And they both spoke about Harvard Business School very passionately. Uh, different times, different experiences, uh, everything, but there was some connectivity there around the community and the experience that you thought, wow, there's something going on here, this is great. Uh, and I think that's what we kind of feel. Um, this is not about brand or not about network or not about, you know, the sort of a buzzword. It really is getting to know people with a sort of a common idea in mind about what you want to do, how you want to accomplish it with uh, high standards, um, with a world class faculty and with a lot of really interesting and smart people that become some of your best friends and colleagues um, around the world. So it's kind of uh, unique, we think. Uh, there are lots of great schools around the world. There are great business schools here. There are great schools in other uh, parts of uh, the US. There are great schools in Europe. Uh, we think that um, you know, HBS has a lot to offer. And we're hoping that we can answer, we've answered uh, some of your questions or concerns. And we'll have a chance just listening to the experiences to say, oh, OK, that's different than what I maybe thought when I got here, or what I thought from reading or listening to the blogs. Or I had a friend that told me something, I heard something that told me something about this. You know, we want you to have great information, good information, so you can make the decision as you kind of go through this process on your own, this journey on your own. Uh, these are just some of the areas that uh, there's faculty expertise. I mean, they're pretty much, you can't really name something that there is an expertise in the faculty. Um, and there are courses that are just so tough to get into because they're so popular, because some faculty members have um, such expertise and so many years of experience. But I think what you'd say of the hundreds of courses that you have to take, you can also during the second year take courses at any graduate school at Harvard University, at MIT Sloan, or at the Fletcher School of Diplomacy at Tufts University. So if, in fact, you can't find it at Harvard Business School, maybe you can find it at the law school, the medical school, the school of public health, the graduate school of design, at MIT Sloan, uh, you've got choices. You know, and it's all about choices and, and really um, exploring things that you um, hadn't really thought about. And we asked this question, and I don't know, maybe you could say, the application, if you remember, there's like a post-MBA career interest. It was like a drop-down box. You had to just check a box that said, this is what you thought when you did your application, what you were going to do. Um, there's a holiday in uh, the US called Thanksgiving. So it's in November. Uh, by November, 40% of the class has changed their mind of what they want to do after the MBA. 40%. That's September, October, November. So why? Because uh, you get exposed to lots of things that you didn't know anything about. You, you meet people from different parts of the world that you've never been. Um, you hear up close and personal about industries that you've read about, but you didn't really know anybody that's worked there before. Well, there is someone in your section. Um, oh, and all the cases that you do explore you the industries and sectors and types of programs and ideas that you wouldn't have before. So again, back to the case method. How is that different than textbook learning? How is that different than um, you know, sort of that traditional model for education? It, it, there's so many different bits and pieces that feed into making this what we hope is a valuable program uh, that is something that people will use through, throughout their career. Uh, life after HBS. Uh, I think the elder statesman here of the panel uh, is 10 years out. You want to talk about life after HBS? Sure thing. Um, so as Jorge and Karim were, were mentioning, um, you know, it's HBS, and you read it in the, in the website, is a transformational experience. And it, it truly is in different, in different ways. Uh, I would say personally, professionally, 
you know, and financially, if you will. And uh, so professionally, um, you have, you know, folks like Jorge that, you know, certainly want to start a new business after HBS, and you go ahead and do that, or Karim that, you know, decide to go to corporate, um, and, you know, do business development in Latin America. And there are folks like me that decided to go back to what we were doing before HBS that was venture capital and decided to stick there, you know? And there are others that, you know, decide to take a risk and can do non-profit or, uh, you know, they go and stay in uh, the U.S. working like I did for five years after HBS. Others come back to Mexico. Karim is in Mexico and, you know, uh, he's uh, originally from, 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 H from the U.S. So, you know, all these post professional possibilities suddenly open up to you. And uh, so that, that's, that's phenomenal. Then the second part I would say is uh, personally, and that you know you enter HBS as a person, and suddenly as you know uh, enhance yourself, and uh, you know you uh, suddenly have a larger network that you had before. Uh, you. Uh, have a different talents. You suddenly realize you suck at other things, as you were saying, and uh, you thought you were good at that. So you know you reinvent yourself, and um, and and in, in in the in the friendship area, I think that for me was the most important part of it. I literally made the best friends I have had in my entire life at, at HBS, and uh, you know I, I got married uh, recently, and uh, you know in you know my wedding where. Probably, you know, 30 of my section mates, you know, from uh, back in, at, in, the, in the first year, you know, a guy from Afghanistan that is working for the Ministry of Finance there, a guy f from uh, Paris, you know, many friends from uh, Mexico. So, you know, it's, you know, those friendships are still there. We have groups, we, you know, speak every, you know, all, all the week. So that, that for me, you know, if I had to go back for HBS, only for the friendship part of the experience, I would definitely do that. You know? And uh, then you know, it comes to the financial part of it. And you know, there are, uh, you know, probably Charles, you will talk more about financial aids later on, but- We will. Yeah, you know, there, there are- I'm sure they're interested in how much it costs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so, and uh, we can talk a little bit about uh, the dollar versus the peso. That's right. <laughs> Some of the challenges involved in that. And we have the foundation here to talk about financing. And, and of course, I'm going to ask you all to say, wasn't it difficult to think about spending that much money to go to school in the United States? And still, with a bit of an hindsight, aren't you glad you did? You're right. I mean, I mean if I'm jumping ahead a little bit because I know this is something you're interested in. Right? No, for, for me, you know, the, the, the pay, payoff was was clear, and it, I I was able to repay my student loans. Uh, you know, a couple of years after I graduated. I mean, and, and a lot depends on you know what is the industry that you choose. What um, uh, you know, if you, what was the mix of financial aid you had, student loans, savings, um, you know, a, a fellowships, fellowships, right. you know, and uh, you know, there are programs that help also people that go into the nonprofit sector with the loan forgiveness program. Is how you guys call it, and so financially, you know, I think for pretty much all of us made made sense. There may be you know some people that say you know. For me, it was still large of an investment, and you know, it didn't work. But I would say that's the smallest percentage of one of us. I mean, if I had to go back with the same salary that I had before HBS, you know, I would definitely do it. It's just for the experience. Great, and we are going to talk a little more about that. I know that's something that you are, are thinking about. I call that the scary slide. Okay. You'll, you'll see. <laughs> it's a little scary, but um, I'm going to eliminate that scary. You know, just like that. Uh, admission. So what do we think about uh, how to get in? Right? So what are we looking for? Uh, you, we shouldn't be surprised at any of these three things. Uh, we're looking for habit of leadership. Um, habit of leadership doesn't mean you have a title that has leader in the word. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have seven people reporting to you or 77 people reporting to you. It can. Uh, but what it means is are you an influence of people around you? Um, do you sometimes see a problem somewhere, you raise your hand and you say, you know what, I'm going to be part of solving that problem. Um, that's leadership. Influencing others, uh, that's leadership. Um, analytical ability and, and appetite, boy, there are a lot of people that are school, Harvard School, they're smart. They are done well in school, they test well, um, they are uh, interesting and they are broad. But it's more than just being smart and tested well. It's
is not having an appetite for learning, that you really do want to learn. And that even though you say, you know, I, I went to HBS because I wanted to change careers, I wanted to be an investment banker. Uh, back when I was doing this, you had to get, have an MBA to do that. There weren't really analyst programs. They sort of were robust. I only wanted to work for one of six bulk rack investment banking firms, um, three of which no longer exist. Right? That's, that is an interesting thing. I would never have known or guessed that when I was working my Baduski off, getting a job with one of those six firms. So uh, my point is, um, you have to spend time doing classes on all these other topics that you think, well, I'm not really interested in that. Now, of course you're interested in marketing and learning about operations research and production and operation management. Uh, of course you're interested in learning about business and government and sort of the bigger picture around strategy and corporate accountability. So if you have that thirst for learning, um, that's something you really want to understand. Uh, the third list is what type of person are you in your community? However you define that, your school, where you work, where you worship, uh, where you live, uh, it can be something that's been important to you for your entire life, something that you just acquired an interest for in terms of community. So we're looking through these three lenses and admissions, trying to understand who you are based on these things. Um, and again, it shouldn't surprise you. Uh, the way the application works, of course, is a written application. We look at your transcript. Uh, you have to take either the graduate management admissions test or the graduate record exam, the GRE or the GMAT. We're 100% indifferent about which you take. Um, take the test you feel comfortable taking and do the best job you can. Um, it's the sort of thing where it's a project, you study, and you can improve your GMAT or GRE score. If you rush to take it and you don't have the time to really go through it, uh, you do yourself a disservice, so take the time to do it. Uh, do we care if you take it multiple times? We don't care. We take the highest score you get. So um, if you don't go to a school where English is the language that's used, uh, we require English proficiency, all of you know TOEFL and these others. Again, it's a project. You just spend the time studying it. You take the test. I think we have a minimum requirement on TOEFL of about 109, um, roughly. So uh, most people you know, don't have a problem with that. We ask you for your resume, uh, what you do. It's not necessarily a, a resume that you need for a job. It's a little bit more expanded. So it could be one page, or I think we're recommending one page is enough. But I say to people, if you want to have a two-page resume, because you want to talk a little bit more about that leadership and the community service type things, you can. You can. Um, recommendations. Um, you've got to pick people that know you well. That's the criteria. Not their title, not who they are, but who they have been in your work life or school life, and are they prepared and willing to spend the time to write you an excellent recommendation. Not just a so-so recommendation, not just a good recommendation. They have to be prepared to really say why they think you're unique and special, and you should come to Harvard Business School. Uh, sometimes people have uh, recommenders that are HBS uh, grads. It's not required. Uh, if it's someone that knows you well, that's what we want, right? Someone says, well, I can think I get the president of New Mexico to be my recommended. That's impressive, right? Sure, that's pretty impressive. Except the question we ask is, how do you know this person? And if he says, well, this is one of the people who voted for me in the last election, <laughs> that's probably not going to be uh, well read you know, by my colleagues, right? It's got to be someone that you've worked with, that knows you, that can compare your work um, to others that they know and have worked with and can say great things about you. So you know, pick those recommenders carefully uh, and have a good set. Don't just pick two, have three or four and, and kind of think about who's prepared to, to work the best with you. And then the, the last part of the essay, the uh, last part of the application was an essay. Uh, the question we ask now is, now that we've seen your transcript, your GMAT, your TOEFL, your resume, and your recommendation, is there anything else you want to tell us? Pretty open-ended. Um, we don't think this is an essay writing contest. What we think this is, is we want to give you the opportunity to personally tell us exactly who you are. It's a blank page. Uh, we've asked lots of questions over the years. When I applied, there were eight essay questions. That's right. Uh, it must have taken me like a zillion years to fill those out, many drafts. And then eight turned into six, then six turned into four. There were some either war options. Um, now it really is, is there anything else you want to tell us? Unlimited word. So you get to decide what you want to say. Um, and it's not about telling us about uh, C-Day, telling us about uh, the company you work for, or telling us about where you, you know, what your title is. 
It's about telling us about who you are, what you've done, and what it means to you. So the more introspective, the more um, thoughtful you are, uh, hopefully, the better results you'll get in terms of writing this, this essay. Um, we take this very seriously. At least two people read every application before someone is uh, declined. Okay? So it's sometimes three people. We have people that have been reading folders for 30, 35 years. So they've heard a lot of stories. They've heard a lot of information. Uh, their experience with schools and universities and programs and jobs in sectors, for-profit, not-for-profit, business, government, industry, all around the world. So you don't have to educate us on what your business is or what industry you work in. You can talk about it. But what we're interested in is who you are and what you are doing and have done. So that's my biggest piece of advice on, on sort of putting that, that essay together. Uh, the interview, so we get 9,500 applications, roughly. Uh, we select 1,800 people to interview. Um, the interviewers are all members of the admissions board. We don't use alumni, uh, although some of us are alumni, but we don't use alumni, we don't use students. Uh, we think it's really important for quality and consistency to have people that are professionally focused on interviewing uh, and interviewing for us. Uh, we interview, of course, in Boston. Uh, we interview in a variety of hub cities, we call them around the world. So we interview in Palo Alto, California. We interview in New York. We interview in Mumbai, in Dubai, uh, in uh, uh, Buenos Aires. We interview in Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, a couple cities uh, in China. And if you can't make it to any of those cities because of time or just the expense of traveling, we interview by Skype video. Uh, and we do this all the time. So it's 30 minutes. Uh, it's someone that has read every single piece of this information and knows you very well. It's not like any job interview you've ever had. Maybe you've been in a situation where you've gone in for a job interview, and you can kind of tell the person that's looking at your resume just looked at it 10 minutes ago or 15 minutes ago. And they ask you, hey, walk me through your resume. Because they haven't really read it. That's not going to happen to you in your Harvard interview. Okay. I mean, someone may ask you that question, but what they're trying to see is, are you able to articulate the two or three or four most important things about your resume? Not that I can go through chronological order. Okay? Uh, so the interview knows you well, they've read all this information, um, and they will focus on, in a conversational, non-pressurized way. I mean, everyone is feeling a little stressed. Uh, we are as interviewers too, because it's important, and candidates are too. I mean, it just happens to be that way. Uh, is anyone applying in round one? Yeah, okay. So uh, we're about to make those, some of those interview announcements. In fact, I think some of them went out today, uh, a, a batch. Some of them are going to go out next Wednesday, and some of them are going to go out next Thursday. So if you heard today, great. If you didn't, that's okay. Hold your breath a little bit, you know, wait till next week because we're sending them out in a, different, in a couple different uh, batches. Um, it's a conversation. That's all it is. Uh, the, I, if I had to describe it, I'd say, um, we want you to shine. And you have 30 minutes, you know, go like that. Do you remember your interviews? Yeah, do you remember? You may not remember the name of your interviewer, because you, know, you just might not know. Or you may remember the name of your interviewer. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but um, wasn't it a conversation? <laughs> Wasn't it just kind of, it went really fast? Super fast. Uh, and didn't you all think, wow, I'm never getting into Harvard Business School or whatever. <laughs> this sucked. I just was, oh boy, I shouldn't have answered that question that way. I should have done that. I should have said that. I should have done this. It's really impossible for you to know how well you do. And when I call people to say, oh, I know you know why I'm calling. And they say, yeah, yeah, I got that email already. This is great. Uh, but you know, Charles, you asked me X, Y, and Z, and I really thought my answer was terrible, and I, I really want to go back and talk to you about this some more. And I smile, and I go, dude, let that go. <laughs> it's okay. Obviously, whatever you said, must have been okay. All right, let that go, let that go. But it's one of those experiences that you take it with you, you think about it. Um, now that I've even mentioned it, you're probably thinking, you may even remember one thing that I asked you, you thought, oh my God, I can't believe you asked me that. Uh, because it's not about the right and wrong answer with these interviews. If I give you, if you happen to make it, it's not about right and wrong answer. It's about how you answer it and what you say. And you got to listen to the interviewer and answer their questions, right? Of course, you're going to come prepared with a few things you want to say. Uh, you have to be prepared. No one rolls out of bed one day and says, "Oh yeah, my HBS interviews today." Oh yeah, it's a, hmm, I got to remember to get there on time. Uh, no one does that. Everyone shows up on time. Most people show up early. Um, I'm kind of assuming if someone's late, I'm thinking, wow, they're in a taxi accident or something. It's pretty much everything shows up. 
Um, we had Hurricane Sandy in New York a few years ago. I don't know if you remember Hurricane Sandy, it was a pretty big deal. Uh, only one person didn't make it. Uh, this person was coming up from DC on Amtrak, is all the trains were close. And I, I was fascinated because it, was, it wasn't the height of the hurricane when it was happening, but it was raining pretty hard. People walked in, they brushed that water off their shoulders, some changed from their rain boots to their shoes, and not one person mentioned the hurricane. They sat down and they got engaged in what we were there to talk about, which is kind of what you would expect, right? But it just goes to show you, it's just one of those things, it's just a conversation. So 1,800 people get invited to interview. Um, about 1,000 get offers uh, for about 900 uh, positions in the class. And we're blessed uh, that about 90% of the people we make offers to say yes. And we're very fortunate uh, that that happens, because generally people have options. They have choices, they have other great schools to choose from. So we're very pleased and happy with that. Um, one thing that's a little bit different that we do is, uh, did all of you have a post-interview reflection? I did. No, right? Okay. So I guess that's really just been in the last four years we've done post-interview reflection because you didn't have. No. Yeah, okay. So, gosh, it's so funny. It seems like we've been doing this forever. Have you ever been in an interview situation or a meeting where as soon as you walked out the door you think, oh, I wish I had said this, I wish I had said that? Did that ever happen to you? Yeah, of course. So the post-interview reflection is uh, within 24 hours after leaving the room, um, you get to sign back onto the system. And the question is something like, how well do we get to know you? And what you're supposed to do with that is to say, well, you know, Charles asked me this question about so-and-so. This is what I was thinking uh, he meant, and this is what I said. But after thinking about it, you know what? I think it this way. I'm going to change my answer. Or, you know, I told him there were five things that I think were important, and I can only remember three at the moment. So I don't want to mention the fourth and the fifth. Or whatever you want to say that as soon as you get out the door, or out to the parking lot, or back to your office, or back home, you want to just clarify or talk about, it gives you the chance to have the last word. You think that's interesting? It's incredibly insightful for us, too. Uh, it's great. It's not an essay. You can't write it up ahead of time. Uh, believe me, if you do, it looks like it. Because if you've written it up ahead of time, it has nothing to do with what you got asked. And yes, your interviewer reads your post interview reflection, too, as well as the direct admissions. Uh, goes back and reads all 1,800 of those interview folders, and all 1,800 of those uh, interview feedbacks, and then all 1,800 of those post interview reflections before making the decision. Um, we really take this stuff seriously. I right, put a lot of personal uh, effort into it. Uh, is there anyone here that's still in university? Okay, so have you heard of 2 plus 2? Uh, the 2 plus 2 program is while you're still in university, uh, what you can do is apply. If, if it's your last semester or your next last semester, you apply for the admissions process for 2 plus 2. If you get it, say you apply in round 3, which will be spring of uh, 2017, if you get in, uh, you're able to go work for a minimum of two years, and you'd be offered a position in the fall of 2019, for the class of 2021, okay? So let me say it again. You're about to graduate in May 2017. In round three, you apply. Um, if you get in, uh, so if you, um, instead of starting in the fall, you gotta work for two years, a minimum of two years, and if you um, then choose, you can start in the fall of 2019 to be a member of the class of 2021. Um, so that gives you some more flexibility. So let's say you're out now two years. You know, you're sitting here, you've been working for two years, you graduated two years ago, you apply. Um, if you get in, you have to come next year. There are no deferrals. So the 2 plus 2 program is a kind of a way to give you a little bit of a deferral uh, to work an extra two years or three years or four years. Some people that get in at 2 plus 2, they come right away. If the two years are up and they come. Some people call up and say, listen, I'm really having a great time in this start I've been working on. And can I work an extra year? Yes, no problem. Um, and even a fourth year. So what's happening is a little bit more experience is never a bad thing. I've worked for four years before applying to HBS. Uh, I don't know, how many years did you? Four. Four years? Three. Three? Three. Three. So what's happened is that minimum of two years, is, with a lot of people, has morphed into three years. Yeah. Uh, because you're sort of thinking, am I ready? Uh, is there another opportunity that may come up on this job? Or maybe I'm about to start another job, and don't I want to stay there for a little bit so I can get some learning experience there? So um, the range of time is a minimum of two years, 
but it could be as much as 15 years, 12 years. I'm sure there were people in your sections that were 10 years out, 12 years out, especially folks in the military uh, that had been out of school for a while, um, and, and some in industry. Um, that decided they wanted and needed to have what they felt was this Harvard Business School education, and they were prepared to do the heavy lifting to come back and work um, because they had a plan. So uh, we've got some data on our website that sort of talks about the average amount of work experience. I mean, it's kind of around 25, 26, 27 years-ish, but there are people on opposite ends of that spectrum. Some just have two years worth of experience, and some have 12 or 15 years worth of experience. So we think, again, getting back to two plus two, it's a fabulous little program. So you apply, you don't get in, no problem. You apply a second time in a couple of years. Or a third time, sometimes people apply a third time. And even, there are even cases of people that apply four times and get in. For this incoming class, uh, 20, uh, where am I? This is 2016, uh, sorry, incoming class of 2018. Yeah, I can't believe it. So for this incoming class of uh, 2018, out of the 900-ish, about 97 reapplies. So these are people we said no to at some point. And now we say yes. So just to be clear, no doesn't mean no forever. No sometimes just means no today. And believe it or not, when you go from 9,500 down to 1,800, I mean, that's a pretty big cut. And those 1,800 people that are interviewing, when you go from 1,800 down to 1,000, the people that don't make it, about half make it. But the people that don't make it, it's not because they're missing by this much, or this much, or even this much. They're missing by this much, mostly. So that's why if you apply a second time, that time you get in. Or you apply a third time, that time you get in. Because if you make it that far, it doesn't mean that it, you've, you're really off base. It just means we, we're blessed to have, of that 1,800, some really talented and interesting and smart people from all around the world. I mean, I'll tell you, one of the most important things I do, and I have other things I do besides just working with Harvard Business School, is having the opportunity to be part of helping shape that class, but it really, with the director of admissions making all the decisions, we just help out. But having the opportunity to really meet some really tremendous and fabulous and interesting people from all around the world, and, and it's a little unfair, because I know a lot about them, they don't know anything about me generally, uh, at least right then and there. Uh, but having the opportunity to really have a conversation about what's important to them, why they've done some of the things they've done in their lives. It's, it's awesome. And even preparing for all this is, I think, um, a remarkable experience. And even once it's over, it's a relief. But it's something you still think about, you know, even years later. That's two plus two. Here's the scary part. Okay. Uh, that's 102,000 US dollars per year. You can see what I mean, you know, it's kind of like, mm. Um, two things about this. First of all, uh, we're very uh, fortunate because we have a lot of alumni that contribute a lot of money to the school, and a lot of that money we use for fellowships. So we give out $35 million of fellowships every year, roughly. $35 million US dollars of fellowships. 50% of the class gets an average uh, fellowship of $35,000 per year. Okay? Um, there are uh, things that are unique here to Mexico. So I'm going to ask uh, Patty, you're going to come up and talk about the foundation? So, let's see. Okay, so um, I. Uh, so, tell a little bit about the foundation, too. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's origin and so forth, please. So, Anna and I uh, worked for the Fundación in Mexico and Harvard, and uh, this foundation was created approximately 27 years ago, mostly by HPS alone, and with the purpose of um, making sure that any Mexican who was accepted to Harvard didn't get to go because of lack of funding. So, uh, the, basically what we do is we give um, support to Mexican students that get accepted to postgraduate uh, or graduate programs at Harvard at any school. And uh, let me tell you a little bit more about the, the specifics. So, um, well, uh, apologies for the same thing. The center button? Okay. <laughs> uh, I'll move over so that you guys can see it. So, um, for, we give out uh, loans or scholarships depending on the program that you're applying to at Harvard. For the case of the business school, it's, uh, it's a loan. And the approximate amount that we give uh, per year is around 2200 22000 Sorry, $22,000, uh, thank you, per year. 
Um, but we also have a scholarship, one scholarship that's giving out uh, based on need, and this uh, is for $25,000 a year. So whoever gets the scholarship doesn't have to repay uh, this money. Um, we give you two years once you graduate to start repaying the money. It's 5% interest. Um, but we're very flexible and work with you depending on where you are. We give you two years because a lot of you want to stay or work abroad um, and use your OPT. So we're flexible and, and on, on that sense. Um, but besides us, I think the most important thing and, and for you to know is that there are sources of funding available to you. Um, and here are some of the other options that we list and that we have on our website as well. So, uh, Pronacy has an um, agreement with UNED um, that will give you money towards uh, your uh, degree. Uh, Fulbright also will give you up to $25,000 a year. The trick here is that for Fulbright, you have to apply a year before you apply to your graduate program. So, if you, want, you know you want to go to HBS and you're going to apply in two years, you have to apply to Fulbright one year before you do that. Um, and then the next, okay. There's also FIDER, which is a loan from Banco Mexico at a very low interest rate. Uh, FUNED, Broadband Scholarships, and other scholarships that are available. Um, or, uh, for example, these student loan programs that, that are available uh, as well. So one thing that we recommend is apply to every single um, source of funding that you find. It's better for you to have extra funding and in the end have to decline it. Um, rather than to have uh, lack of funding. And um, so what Charles was mentioning also, you know, if you start adding up, business school will give you money if you, if you need it, up to $35,000 a scholarship. Per year. Per year. Okay. But you can also, um, generally they, they pair this with a, a loan at the, with their institution, of, it's called Harvard University and Police Credit Union. Um, and it can be also for uh, students at HBS up to $75,000 a year in, in a loan. So let's say you have $35,000 from the business school, let's say you take another thirty, dollars you know, from the Harvard University Employees Credit Union, you get $22,000 from us, plus from a seat, let's say you get $15,000 plus the you know, um, that's around $10,000 a month, and you get to $200,000 a year, et cetera, et cetera. You keep adding and team, you're able to reach the amount. So it's super important for you to see it as a life investment. You're investing personally and professionally on something that will definitely pay off um, once you finish. And I guess a question for you is, how many people have declined after being accepted because of lack of funding? Uh, zero. Okay. No one that gets in says at the end of the day, no, oh, I can't come because I'm 40,000 short, or 12,000 short, or 50,000 short. There's a way to make this work. Um, once you have a letter that says you've been accepted to Harvard Business School, a lot of doors open up for you. Um, companies you work for, sometimes companies decide, you know, we want to sponsor you. Um, not that we talk about this widely, but there are a lot of uh, uh, your fellow countrymen here, men and women, that support this. And in behind the scenes, They'll do what they can to make it possible to catch if there's a little bit of a gap here and there. So let me say it again. There's no one that's gotten into Harvard Business School that at the end of the day says, I can't go because of the money issue. Um, there's a bit of a culture here that you don't really want to borrow a lot of money, um, you don't want to leverage yourself. That is something to think about. And it's a little, little scary to think about signing that promissory note for $75,000 a year. I mean, it, you know, it's not easy, but um, one of the reasons that there are loans that you're given for a lot of this is because you're able to pay this off. Um, the average starting salary for the last class, not including bonuses, is about 135,000 US dollars. Uh, in terms of people coming to Latin America, the average starting salary for the last class 2015 year was about uh, 95,000 dollars without bonuses. And this is an average of a broad spectrum of people that are working in lots of different careers and industries. Um, there are loan forgiveness programs for people that come back and work in government. There are loan forgiveness programs for people um, uh, that are taking alternatives and not going off and, and doing you know, sort of these high income jobs, some things around entrepreneurship. So there are ways to make this work and ways to make it happen. And if you haven't heard anything else I've said, the one thing I want you to hear is you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So if you choose not to apply, I guarantee you you won't get it.
I mean, I know it sounds completely silly, but people self-select themselves out of this process because they think it costs too much money, or it's Boston, or it's moving to the U.S., or it's, I'll never get in, I just won't get in, I'm never going to get in. Uh, you can't make that decision. But if you choose not to apply, you definitely won't get in. So I'm kind of hoping everyone in the room applies. If you're interested after hearing this, if you came interested, or you uh, spend time on our website and you look at the information, you've heard what the panelists say, you've heard what uh, Anna and Patty have to say, and you think, you know, I can see myself sitting in that chair doing those cases. I think that would be really cool to do. Then you should take the shot. Oh, those are the deadlines. So some have already applied in round one, and you'll be hearing, um, I think today's Tuesday, so maybe uh, some of those uh, interview requests went out today. Some will go out next Wednesday, and some will go out next Thursday. Uh, the next round is January. Uh, what we encourage uh, international applicants, given the way the U.S. immigration system works, is it's better to apply in round one and round two. Because in round three, we, we still take some really great people in round three. Obviously, most of the class is kind of uh, filled by then, but there's, we still have great people. But it's just waiting for the visa uh, can be just a um, sweating bullets kind of experience. Because by the time you get to May, when you get the decision, you've got to turn that letter in and the way the process runs. Being able to get your visa by August is just tough. So we would encourage people to apply in round one and round two. Um, what, else? what else? Oh, and for two plus two, uh, we're, we're sort of pushing all the two plus two applicants to apply in round three. Because um, obviously it's going to be two years from now, so it doesn't matter about, uh, about the visa. You, you can take care of that. Hey, we're at the end. Thank you. <laughs> so, what questions did we answer? In other words, what questions do you have? For me, or uh, for uh, the foundation, or for any of the panels? Please. Yes. I'm sorry, say it. Will you recommend those who are? Oh, yeah, you got to have two years of work experience that starts after you graduated from university. So some of you have uh, internship experience while you're going to school. That doesn't count. It certainly counts in terms of your learning and what you might want to talk about in your application. But you need two years of full-time work experience after the date that you graduate uh, as a minimum. And some people work longer, uh, three years, three years, four years, uh, four years, uh, but two years minimum, full time work experience. Okay. Well, Charles, but yes. except for the two plus two, right? Well, obviously, with the two plus two, uh, if you apply when you, you know, during the spring of your last semester, so right, you've got to work for two years. Right? So you don't have to have that two years work experience for you to apply. We know that you're just still in university. I'm going to explain this right. So, you know, while you're still in university in your, in your last year, if you apply for two plus two, uh, if you get in, you say, here's your letter of acceptance. You've got to go away and go work for two years before coming back, and you're guaranteed a position to start in the class. So, is that clear? Yep. Does everyone understand that, those of you that are in university? Because it's, it's a little confusing, and I'm doing this in English, and some of it I might lose, I might lose a little something in the translation. So, uh, other questions? Please. So I'm very interested in the entrepreneurship section. Yes. Developing some type of project while I'm studying. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm, um, I would like to, uh, if you could tell us a little more about all that experience and also what are all the resources that are at your disposal to make this happen. Sure. Um, well, um, obviously a, a certain percentage of the class people show up interested in entrepreneurship. So you have the whole uh, uh, Rock Center, which is a standalone program that has um, faculty, 35 faculty members that are focusing around entrepreneurship. Uh, there are executives and residents, uh, about 15 of them, that are coming from all over the United States that spent two years at HBS helping you kind of fulfill your entrepreneurial dream. Uh, there's the Harvard Innovation Center. That's a place, a collaboration place, a maker place, sort of an accelerator place where you can go and help build a team. Uh, to sort of grow ideas with people. So anyone at Harvard University has the opportunity to come um, and sort of work at the uh, Innovation Lab. Um, the first year it opened, there were 16,000 unique visits. So people coming from all of Harvard University, uh, people from MIT Sloan come, uh, and you know, it's how you find a team, it's how you get advice, it's how you do market research, it's how you get legal or accounting advice uh, to maybe help you with your idea. 
Um, field two is really designed around this whole going overseas, working on this complex pro problem of innovation for either a startup or a multinational type company. So you end up learning a little bit about, depending on what your field experience is, you can learn a lot about starting a new business, whether it's in an established company or whether it's a plain startup. Um, so there are lots of resources. Anything else for the entrepreneurial side that, that I missed? What else can we talk about? Yeah. So. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff. Um, field three is is all about launching a business, so that's a pretty cool experience. You actually, it was um, it, it was mandatory before. Uh, apparently, Charles is telling us that it, it is now optional, but you can take the class in the EC year. Basically, that's launching a project. So you form a team, you get money. The school puts up money. Uh, it, in my time, it was five thousand dollars that you would just get a check. You get the money and you can go launch a business. You get like all the support from the from the whole university to do so. Uh, one of the things that you get, and this that is ridiculous, and you can only like really appreciate it once you're there, is the whole like professor support that you get. Uh, just to give you an example, and it doesn't stop while you're at school. Like a bunch of my friends started businesses before school, some of them while at school, and a lot of them like myself after school. And, but you, you never stop having the support. Like just to give you an example, I had myself today a call this morning with a professor at business school from the entrepreneurial unit because I just sent him an email and told him, Jeff, I need to talk to you. And a couple days ago, and he was like, okay, let's talk Monday, uh, Wednesday, well, his assistant. So they set it up, I have a call with him. And then it was an amazing call, I get to follow up with him uh, next Wednesday or Thursday. We're just working on the schedule. But when you still get there, and you get access to these minds, to your peers. Uh, there's the iLab, which is amazing. You get a space that you can work out of. And uh, while at school, you, get, uh, you can get a seat, and you can get basically like, free office space and free Wi-Fi and free food and you're working on your project and you get like all the support. But afterwards you can still apply for memberships and you can still get out of school, you get like all the support so you can get like office space and mentorship and people that will support you and like it is it is just really cool. And funds and loan forgiveness and so it's uh, Harvard Business School is not really regarded as an entrepreneurial business school but it is it is ridiculous. It is it is just way too much, and it's much more focused than you probably hear from the outside. So there are lots of resources. Yeah. People that show up with specific ideas. They don't, they don't want to go get a summer job at a corporation. They want to spend time on campus. There are funds available to pay you during your summer between your first and second year, uh, like it's your summer job. So you work in your business. People work for the first year. You put a team together over the course of the year. So that's what happens. You realize second year, hey, this isn't going to work. Um, one person may go one way, another person may go another way. Uh, but still the entrepreneurial approach. Um, and some people, after going through field two and field three and trying to start a business their first year, decide, you know what? They don't want to go work for General Electric in their gas turbine division. Uh, because I don't think I'm set to be an entrepreneur. And the other thing happens too, that people that show up say, you know, if they don't want to work in the gas turbine division in General Electric, they get exposed to the field and they realize, no, I think I really want to be an entrepreneur. So this is about, we use this word transformation, and it's transformational, and we take it seriously. It's not just a buzzword or a marketing expression. It really does happen. Yes, please. Um, if I graduated like, a few months ago, can I still apply to the to booster program? Yes. So because people are graduating in December or graduating in May at a different time, you just have to look on our website because we get some guidance on some dates. But you have about nine months from when you graduated to still apply. Okay? But you gotta check the dates carefully. And if after reading the website, you don't know, you're not clear, you send an email to that email address and say, I graduated on this date, can I still apply? I'm thinking I can in round one. Or around. So just to be clear, yes, you can. And then, like I said, if you go ahead and apply and you don't get in, that's, it's interesting and good practice to kind of go through the application process. Uh, and that second time or third time you do it, you're certainly going to be better at it. Okay. Uh, yes, please. Uh, I had a question uh, for the panel. Sure. Uh, it's mostly based on I want to kind of know what projects you guys worked in before you went to HBS, like in your job, you're at least four years, three years, and three years. What sort of projects you guys were involved in when, before you went to HBS? So those, what projects were you involved in before you went to HBS, your experience? 
Sure. Um, so uh, I worked for about a year in the nonprofit sector, in the environmental nonprofit, and there I participated in a, the writing of a book on the loss of forests in Mexico. Then I switched uh, into the private sector, and um, I was part of a team that launched this fund in Mexico is called Discovery Americas, and uh, with, within that fund, we um, put together the business plan of what is now Volaris, the low-cost airline, and um, and, a, and a few other investments. So um, that's, that, those are the projects that I, that I work in. So for me, it was I, I was basically at DHL Express, and some of the projects that I worked at were just designing like really specific solutions for some of the clients that we had. So one of the things that we did, for example, was and I was part of the team. I was definitely not leading it, and that's part of like the leadership thing that, that Charles was talking about. You don't. And I was just part of the team. But uh, what we did was we basically redesigned the whole process for how you get visas in Mexico for the U.S. So we were working, the, like the U.S. consulate was the, was a client, and we redesigned the whole logistical flow on how you would have to go do uh, your interviews and take your prints taken and, and your, like, eye scan, and then go to, like, the interview, and then how the passports get handled, and who has them, and what facilities, and then we would have to, like, set up, like, facilities with, like, cameras and, like, you know, like, all this stuff, and then get those passports back to, um, to the people that got their business. So, for example, that kind of project, very operational, very, uh, very like, like that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, it was a mess. <laughs> um, my first two years out of the undergrad, I would say my main project was trying to survive the financial crisis. <laughs> um, working in a large bank from 2007 to 2009, a bank that, that doesn't exist independently anymore. So, really, it was just, you know, coming in 2007, it was the, really the, I would say the, the peak of the, the banking boom, We've seen some of the movies like the, the Big Short or things like that where it's illustrated and, you know, coming in after doing an internship in 2006, it's like, wow, things are going great, you can make a lot of money in, in this industry, and then immediately things went off a cliff. So just two very challenging years trying to, um, I mean, analyze real estate investments in, uh, in the corporate sector, commercial real estate in the U.S., um, and after that, between between my first and second job, I took the summer off to, to just travel, to have a different experience, to take a bit of a break. So I took three months off, and then I was lucky to, to land a job in a, a private equity fund that is was in the process of, uh, or was soon to go public as a, as a, a real estate uh, traded company. So in that year, I worked on projects uh, investing in, in hotels, at helping the company add to their portfolio, sell some assets from their portfolio, and uh, restructure some of the mortgages. Thank you. I want you to think I'm really ignoring you back here. I'm really impressed back here. Uh, I'm curious about the new program. Uh, you said that you team up with five different Sure, the, the way we all design is um, we use quite an elaborate algorithm to sort of select people. So you have got to make sure that the projects that people haven't worked in those sectors, they haven't worked in the country, they don't know the people, they're not in their section. Um, so the idea is to really expose you to as many different out of your comfort zone uh, things as possible. So while you can say you were interested in going to Asia or interested in going to Africa or interested in going to Latin America, uh, you don't get to pick the country, but you get to sort of say this is the region. And that region has to be a place where you haven't worked, uh, you haven't really lived, uh, and you haven't really traveled as other than maybe the tourists. So the people, you're, you're assigned. I mean, there's kind of a drum roll situation where uh, it's a big deal to figure out what your field assignments are and who your teammates are. Uh, and that can be exciting and interesting. And, and you have a few months to work on your project uh, in the first semester before going in the second semester. Okay? Uh, but sometimes what happens is by the time you've worked on it in the first semester, by the time you hit the ground and the company you're going to help, uh, well, at first meeting, they might have and say, well, you can pivot a little bit from when we told you this assignment. I know you came here to think we were going to be in the, uh, the wooden table business, but we're actually going to be in the glass bottle business now. What? 
we've been studying wooden tables for a few weeks now, and now you're telling us you're going to be in the glass bottle business? Uh, yeah, because uh, some investors came in, and that's where the money is. Well, time's ticking, right? But you can't say, oh, we're going back to the States now. We really didn't sign up for glass bottles. You just have to, you know, go with it like the real world. So it, that's, does that answer your questions about the uh, field? Okay, cool. And so, please. So my, my question is for for Jeff. It's uh, what would you recommend us to like do to apply, like the steps before applying, so you can be able to have uh, like better uh, applying than if you know nothing. Best practices like, for uh, application. Um, so I, I, I've answered this question to um, to a few people, and in, 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 or people have asked this question in a few different forms before. The probably the, the best advice I can give for the application itself is to uh, to, to be vulnerable, to, to be to be genuine. I mean, I, I, I even when when I was uh, you know writing some essays um, at at the at the time when I was applying. I had a friend that I trusted. He was uh, also an HBS alum, and I sent I sent him a few of the essays, and one of them was, "What well, What's your biggest mistake?" And when I wrote the essay, I, I I had a mistake in mind that was like a really big mistake, and then but I put a smaller mistake in in that essay. And um, you know, my friend read the essay, and when we spoke, he was like, you know, that essay, he was like, "That's pretty weak. That's a pretty weak answer." And then you know I took his feedback and I wrote, I wrote it again and, and wrote down the the real mistake, the actual big mistake that I had made, and you know how it impacted other other parts of my life and my career. And I think that that general type of approach to the application process, because I want one of the the, the tenets of, of HBS is authentic leadership, right? Be authentic, be true to who you are. So I, I can't I can't tell you a. a you know, for, for this part of the application or, or, or that, this this would be the best practice, but I would say just as a general approach for how you write the application, how you present yourself, if you have the chance to get an interview, how, how you, you know, even writing your resume, I would say be, be vulnerable. It's, it's, it's okay to, to have to, to not be perfect in what you've done, to make those mistakes. That's that's really what we're, what we're all bringing to the classroom in some way, you know, the the positive things you've done, the, the negatives, everything you've learned along the way. So that my advice would be to be vulnerable, be authentic, and put yourself out there. I mean, just following up on, on what Karim said, uh, I mean, the, the worst advice I have heard about applications is build your resume, right? Is, uh, okay, you should build your resume. I mean, what, what does that mean, right? I mean, how many people, Charlie, have you interviewed in the past year that have run marathons, for example? So suddenly people are like, oh, I'm going to run a marathon because that's going to show leadership, right? And in the first question, it's like, okay, what was your time in your marathon, right? And then there are 50 other people that have ran 20 marathons in the past year. So, you know, start changing yourself, as Karim was saying, and then just, you know, put yourself out there to be, you know, a stronger professional or a better athlete, or that, that would be the worst recommendation I could give. No, it's just follow, you know, try to understand who you are and think about, yeah, but there was these, these questions uh, when I applied back you know, a while ago, but it was, how do you define success? You know, what is your know, big mistake? Um, there was other, like, um, uh, you know, tell us about your three most substantial accomplishments. Um, there, are, you know. There, so, if you think through those questions, those are really deep questions that go into who you really are and what do you want to do. And so, think through those and you know, try to be, as you said, Karim, you know, authentic and you know, out there. And just to be like super brief, the only thing I would add is there's no way to game the system. Like there's no way to make a perfect application with a with like a like a recipe, right? There's nothing like that. So you need to be super authentic and you need to convey as a, as Jose Antonio was saying, just who are you and what do what do you wanna like say on this essay? So probably the best advice is just 
take a lot of time to, to prepare your uh, your application because it's it's a very complicated uh, like like thing to do. It's also very rewarding, I think, as as Charles was saying. But you have to do it properly. If you do it in a rush, it's definitely like won't come out with the uh, with the right quality. Hi, I'm Gabriela, I'm working on my application right now, and I have a follow of questions for the essay part. Uh, you were mentioning before that so many people change their idea for their future plans. So, how would you approach uh, a future plan in the essay piece if it is an important part for your application? I mean, in my case, I tried to do uh, a career change uh, by doing the MBA, so I do want to talk about future plans, but as you mentioned, that so many people change their minds, so I don't know if it's a good idea or not. I mean, what I would say to that is, I mean, it's, it's perfectly good to do and, and write about what you're thinking about right now. I mean, who are you right now? You cannot forecast who you're going to be in the future. Most likely, uh, what you write about right now will change in, if, if you go into the MBA and any MBA, not just uh, HBS, but will change in a few months. But so what? You know, like, I mean, you have to write what you're, about what you're interested about right now. Who are you right now and what's where you want to take your career? And I mean, you, it's okay to make plans. It's also okay to, uh, to change them. Just, and as Karim said, like, be vulnerable about it. Like, it's, it's fine to change, you know? Yeah. I'll just probably add, there are two traits that I think are important for the HBS sort of philosophy and, and, uh, and culture. And it's, one is passion for what you're doing, right? And the, the other is leadership. So, um, so I think that as long as you currently, as Jorge was saying, what you are doing now show that passion and that you really have this goal in life, the goal way beyond where you are right now, regardless of if you change it. And if you have the ability to energize people you know, and convey a message and motivate people to achieve that goal, I think that is, that, that is important. You know, leadership, passion, and ethics, maybe. No, the third one. No, not maybe, and ethics. Um, I wanted to know about the, can you tell us about an experience that happened to you while being at HPS that, that you say, thanks to this experience that I have, this is what really, really makes the difference of uh, choosing another business school. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty big question. Yeah. Este... Uh, by chance, do any of you have other choices for business schools that you would apply to? Do you mind talking about that as well? One, one big part of that goal goes uh, back to what Charles described at the beginning, the, the, the case method. Um, I, I had the, the option to choose between four, four different business schools. And, um, you know, after, actually it was on, on the day of my, my HBS interview, uh, that was the first time I sat in on a class to really observe that, that dynamic at HBS. And I had visited some of the other schools where um, it was... I mean, many schools have part of their curriculum as, as the case method, but in HBS is one, I believe it's the only one that is 100% case method. So yes. in terms of a, a true differentiator and thinking about how, how do I want to spend two years uh, of my time in, with, with the classroom experience? And I mean, there's obviously many excellent business schools and you know, so, some folks appreciate better, uh, more lecture style or a uh, different style of, of instruction. But at, at HBS, um, just that, that the case method is it's, it's very, it, it's hard to, to convey. I mean, we, we can say it's awesome and it's great, but it, it's, for me, it's hard to describe just the, the energy in, in the classroom, especially in the, you know, especially in, in, the, in the first year, the first time you, you, you know, maybe after the first few weeks, everybody kind of has the hang of it. Okay, this is how it goes. But just the, once the, the professor starts that class, it's just like the room is electric. 
You know, there's a certain energy. Everybody wants to participate, make, make their point, make good points, not just speak just so they, they can be heard, but make a point that actually will, will drive the conversation. So I think that's that's really a point of differentiation for, for HBS and something that uh, can't be found in that same form anywhere else. So I think your, your question is super difficult because I don't think I can think about many specific moments that were like different or like way, way, way like above, you know, the average. I would say the problem is the average is, is way too high. So I cannot, like a bunch of the things that I, I think are amazing about HBS, I cannot map them out at a specific period of time because they were like a continuous or they were like a semester or they were a project or they were, it's it's like, it's not peaks. It's just like the, the whole level is like, very, very high, and as Jose Antonio was saying, like one of the things that I would definitely go back for, and, and one of the things that I took out of HBS that are amazing is just the, the friendships that you that you get out of it, like the amazing friendships and, and so many that you get. You get your best friends out of HBS, and, and sometimes they actually replace in, in a weird way because not really some of the best friends that you had before, before business school, but uh, in my experience, I, I also had something similar to you. I, I was in Brazil weeks ago for a wedding of one of my very good friends and it was amazing to get that, that kind of reunion and everyone was there we were, it was like 30 of us mostly latins the latin community is like very very strong it's like the whole like argentinians and colombians and uh chileans and like it's it's super strong in spaniards uh but everyone was there and you get this reunion and you get like this electricity of of being back with with your friends and being able to connect and to talk about everything and, and catch up and talk about interesting stuff and politics and business and it's it's just there like all the time and so one thing that I can tell you is that I can probably I cannot count the how many times uh, I was there and I was in class or I was at my apartment or just at chat playing soccer or with my friends at, at, at like a bar or Whatever, like how many times I just really reflected and at that specific moment in time, I was like, I cannot believe I'm here. Like this is just way too good. This is just like, how, how did I like deserve to be here? That I can tell you, that was like countless moments that I, like specific moments that I remember like, this is just ridiculous. It's, uh, it's exactly the, the case method. Mechanics, no? The, the guy at the end just has to fill out with something else. But, <laughs> no, the, the, uh, I, I, I guess uh, for me, an experience that I enjoyed very much was uh, putting together the Latin American conference back at, at, at HBS. And, um, you know, it started with a, you know, with this idea just to organize it. And, um, and at the end, you know, it, we ended up you know, inviting more than, you know, 800 uh, students from different universities. We had two presidents talking. Um, we had two former ministers of finance, two CEOs of a very large corporations, and, you know, seven panels on different industries, healthcare, venture capital, um, the environment. Uh, so, you know, it was just, you, know, you didn't, we didn't pay anybody to attend the conference, right? So it just, people that want to go there and share their ideas and, you know, you're learning from the best. Um, and and that, is, that is what I, you know, an experience that definitely I remember very much. And you probably go out any subsequent Latin American conferences? I'm sorry. Have you gone to any of the other conferences over the last ten years? I, I have, yes. And they've all grown in numbers. They have, yeah. They have, yeah. They have. So been, it's but, kind of a student-run conference, but there are hundreds of people that come from Latin America to go to Boston that's right. to talk about Latin American business. Exactly. And I think that's uh, something that's unique and special. In terms of other schools, I mean, you guys have been a little modest, and I can understand that. But you know, for example, I got into the University of Virginia the Garden School. It's also a case method school where it was started by the school professors, and I haven't got a full ride there. Um, that would have been sweet, no question, but I chose Harvard Business School because of the case method, uh, because I wanted to be able to uh, be part of that global, I hate to say it, but that was the word, brand, the global brand. Um, and I just wanted something different in terms of the learning experience, so that made a big difference to me. Most people have choices of other business schools and other programs, and um, it's a good thing that chose it. It's a good thing that chose it. Uh, one more question? Anyone? Uh, I know, no pressure. Here we go. 
We see some wrong there on there. Uh, if you reach at any point in your program, you have any experience, uh, uh, the feeling that you were tired of meeting with your team for uh, analyzing the case, and if that happened, uh, how did you manage? And uh, from where did you get all the theory that you need to answer the uh, more uh, specific cases, like for example, from where do you get the information to answer a financial case or a, or a, a case in, from Asia or that kind of cases that you have no experience in that, in that area? Sure. So, that's a crushing last question. That's very good. Yeah. That's very so, good. so just the first question, what, the first part of the question was if we... Well, he's sort of saying, hey, did you get tired of going to groups? Did you get tired of doing the cases? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, being exhausted and having to do all this work, and you just didn't want to get up at 7 o'clock and meet with your teammates. And how did you address that? How did you deal with that? Did it ever happen? Yeah. No, I mean, it's a, it's a work hard, play hard environment, right? So it's, uh, and there, there's a fear of missing out that Charles was mentioning, and you have like very active social life, and then you have to study with your student study group and you know do the cases. So I never got tired. I mean, it was how many cases are there in like total? Right. There's some days you do three cases, and some days you do two. Yeah. Uh, we say about 600 cases. 600 cases, you no, know, in, in your test. So you know it. It just changes all the time in you know, topic, industry, geography, etc. So I, you know, for me it was not it was not something boring at all, no, or difficult. And um, and the second part was how did you learn yeah. the nuts and bolts, right? I mean, it's not that you run a case on discounted cash flow and that you somehow were supposed to just understand so discounted cool. cash flow analysis yeah. just from reading. Yeah. So the technical nature of some of the things in finance or technology and operations management. How did you learn those things? That's right. Yeah. It, 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 normally you hear that, you know, you, you think about the case method where you know just reading the case and there's no background information, you no, know, or background theory on the case. But that's not true. You no, know, it's normally cases that are hard, you know, come together with you know booklets where you know they explain what you're dealing with. You have one of the largest business libraries in the world, the Baker Library, where you know you can attend any time. And then last you're learning from the best in different fields. So your 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 learning team in the morning, you get together with them and then you you know you can bounce ideas off. You can reach out to the faculty anytime. And um, yeah I guess then you learn in the classroom, right? There are things that you know I didn't know about, you know operations or you know even finance and you know I would come prepare and you know I would probably have another angle to the discussion but would not be you know the strong person in that specific field. No. So that I, I think it's a very comprehensive way you can address the subjects and the tasks you are being handled. And there are textbooks. The third tech, oh, well, the library. You, you, you think that you have textbooks because we're talking about the case study all the time? Well, they're textbooks. Uh, before you start, uh, aren't there some online accounting and online finance and online exercises that you do the summer before? That if you don't get above a certain grade, you can't start? Uh, yeah, there is. The answer is there is. Um, so there, uh, there's something called H3X, which is sort of Harvard Business School's online curriculum core. Uh, certificate of readiness. So it's for people that maybe manage or maybe have gone to school in the humanities or social sciences basically, but decide, hey, I want to get a job in banking. So I don't know, I, I graduated Phi Beta Kappa with honors in Italian uh, and European history, but I'm not convinced uh, an investment bank that they should hire me. Well, you take core, uh, where you get accounting, finance, strategy, economics, online taught by real Harvard school, business school professors with real cases with accountability and testing and grades. And we make core available now to the uh, first three incoming students. So of the 900 students that um, matriculate, about uh, 400 took core uh, as a way to get prepared. So it's not like, I know it sounds like it, but it's not like, here's the case, how are you going to understand the weighted average cost of capital and levering or unlevering betas? Uh, and, and, and are you going to be able to risk adjust this or risk adjust that based on blah, 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 blah? Yeah, you get to know the technical details. <laughs> um, can we thank the panel for coming? Uh,
thank you very much for your time. Uh, I think we might stick around for another 15 minutes or so, so if you have some individual questions you want to ask me or any of the panelists, uh, please uh, talk to the foundation, get to know the foundation, whether or not you're applying now or next year or two years from now. These are great folks to get to know. And again, thank you for your interest in our business. I'm super jealous, no? Well, not about doing the application, but going. Uh, the application for the Just one essay question. I have some questions. I don't know if I do. And then the cost. Well, no. Santiago es hijo de Bernardo Sepúlveda, 